Thank you very much, colleagues. And the next item is continuation of Stage 3 proceedings on the Planning Scotland Bill. And we pick up where we left off uh, last night. I would just remind members that we have 45 minutes this afternoon uh, to deal with the remaining amendments. If members be aware, and I'm going to start straight in on the marshalled list and call Group 38, Forestry and Woodland Strategy. And could I ask Andy Whiteman to move and speak to Amendment 207. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment uh, 207. 207. Get there. Okay. Um, so, the, the, the third National Planning Framework um, highlighted trees, woodlands and forests as economic uh, and environmental uh, assets. In addition to that, National Planning Framework 3 reiterates the aim for expansion of woodland over the next 10 years to support carbon emission reductions and wider land use objectives. Current Scottish planning policy says that local planning authorities should do the following. One, to identify woodlands of high nature conservation value and include policies for protecting and enhancing their condition. And two, to consider preparing forestry and woodland strategies as supplementary guidance to inform the development of forestry and woodland uh, in their area, including the expansion of woodland of a range of types to provide multiple benefits. And I'm pleased to note that, in fact, all planning authorities, with the exception of Aberdeen City, Shetland and Orkney, have such a strategy already in the case of councils like Highland, uh, quite sophisticated strategies, and in fact they're in their second or it might be their third uh, iteration of it. The three, strat the three councils that do not have strategies do, however, have supplementary uh, guidance, Aberdeen, Shetland and Orkney. So Amendment 207 in my name uh, requires all planning authorities to prepare a forestry and woodland uh, strategy. And importantly, this requirement is to be fulfilled as the authority sees fit, provided it covers the key elements in subsection uh, 2. Now, given that planning authorities already publish these um, as either a strategy or supplementary guidance, this amendment merely gives them a statutory footing and ensures that they should be continued to be produced. So I move amendment, amendment 207. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whiteman. I call Graeme Simpson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, I think it's a really useful amendment from Andy Whiteman. Um, it's... It says that planning authorities to prepare uh, forestry and woodland strategy. It should identify woodlands of high nature conservation value in their area, set out the planning authorities' policies and proposals into their area as to the development of forestry and woodlands, the protection and enhancement of woodlands. Um, and presiding officer, as a member of the Woodland Trust and a species champion for the holly tree, I welcome Brother. this uh, addition <laughs> to planning laws. I want to see woods and forests protected. If there's a climate emergency, as the First Minister says, then our planning system should not be making it easy to chop down trees. We need more of them, not less, and we should plan for that. So I say well done to Mr Whiteman for introducing this, and we shall be wholehearted supporters of his amendment. Thank you, and I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, forestry and woodlands are an integral part of both our urban and rural landscapes, and I agree that it is important that strategies are prepared for their protection, enhancement and resilience. This amendment introduces a requirement for planning authorities to prepare and consult on forestry and woodland strategies for their areas or in collaboration with other authorities across a wider area. However, this is not new. Strategies are already prepared as a matter of course by the majority of our planning authorities, as Mr Whiteman has already pointed out, either singly or in collaboration, as encouraged by Scottish planning policy and guidance on the right tree, right place. This amendment takes that position a step further. However, I agree the time is right to do so in the context of recent changes through our Forestry and Land Management Scotland Act, the new Scottish Forestry Strategy and in response uh, to climate change. I thank Mr Whiteman for working with us on this and I'm happy to support his amendment. Thank you, Minister. And I call Mr Whiteman to wind up. Do you wish to add anything? Uh, nothing to add. I just welcome members' support. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 207 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn to Group 39, Mineral and Peat Working. I call Amendment 208 in the name of Claudia Beamish, grouped with Amendments 209, 210 and 211. Claudia Beamish to move Amendment 208 and speak to the other amendments. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This... 
This suite of complementary amendments seeks to update and modernise the planning system around Scotland's peatlands. The importance of this special habitat has only grown in recent years owing to its capacity as a vital natural carbon sink. Members will recall I spoke to similar amendments, amendments at stage two, but did not move them at the time listening to the Minister's concerns. I thank the Minister for discussing these amendments with me, and also I would like to put on the record the support of civil servants, including Andy Kinnaird, in this respect. However, given further work, I do remain convinced that the system of permissions and extraction rights around this habitat are out of date and no longer fit for purpose. I intend to listen very carefully to what the Minister is saying um, before I decide finally whether to move these amendments or not. Many local authorities do not have the comprehensive information of the permissions that exist, never mind the fact that many permissions shouldn't exist at all in the context of Scotland's climate emergency. The Scottish Government has given high priority to phasing out peat use, and I commend them for that, and peat extraction in, in recognition of the significant climate change impacts and adverse effects on water and wildlife resulting from damaged peatlands. But around 0.5 million square uh, cubic metres of peat is still extracted annually in Scotland, removing a carbon store that takes thousands and thousands of years to form, resulting in the loss of almost all biodiversity value on those sites and changes to hydrology that can have negative effects on flood management for our communities and populations as well. The Scottish Government is rightly spending millions of pounds per annum on the Peatland Action Fund to restore degraded peatlands across Scotland. It surely makes sense for coherent policy to prevent the degradation of further sites in Scotland, of which the costs of restoration could well lie with the public purse. The Climate Change Bill is set to legislate and, and has now at stage two accepted a, a target of net zero emissions by 2045, and the net is important here. The UK Committee on uh, Climate Change, in its advice for net zero targets, states it is confident Scotland could, fe could feasibly achieve this higher target than the rest of the UK due to its greater sequestration capabilities. With increasing global recognition of the need for carbon reductions from land use activity, these proposals offer a relatively quick and cost-effective opportunity to address the issue in the public interest. The Scottish Government supports the UK Government's targets to, for retail soil supplies to be peat-free by 2020 and for commercial horticulture to end the use of peat by 2030. The Scottish Government has also set a target to restore 250,000 hectares of peatland by 2030. These amendments are entirely in line with this policy position and I still I'm um, wanting to be really clear from the Minister as to whether these should be moved or not. I move to the amendments and I hope people will bear with me, uh, members will bear with me because they are technical in nature and in a sense whether I move them or not it's very important today I think that it's on the record what the issues are in order for us to move forward together as a parliament um, uh, with the Scottish Government leading on this particularly if I don't, don't move them. Amendment 208 would allow planning authorities to impose nature conservation as a recognised aftercare condition. Currently, Schedule 3 of the Town and Country Planning Act uh, 1997, Scotland, sets out three potential uses, uh, agriculture, forestry and amenity. In a note on this amendment to, uh, from the Scottish Government, for which I thank the Minister, it was explained that amenity in the existing legislation is defined as land suitable for sustaining trees, shrubs and other plants founding in a planning advice note 64. Reclamation of surface mineral workings. This is welcome, although critically missing from that list is peatland restoration, and my amendment would remedy this with a broader definition. The planning advice note indeed um, was up for revision and consultation in 2015 and has had no update since January 2017. Can the Minister confirm whether he still intends to update this um, PAN 64 as recommended by the Open Cast Coal Review? And will he commit to consulting on the adequacy of the advice on aftercare and the priority given to nature conservation, particularly um, if, if we don't move forward with the amendment today? I also highlight that since stage two, this amendment has been 
edited by myself to, on the advice of the Minister to remove the involvement of SNH. And I won't go into the details of that, but I think that is appropriate, because they are only in an advisory role. Um, this amendment is very reasonable given the environmental and climate emergency, and SPICE have confirmed that it would strengthen the status of nature conservation, particularly in the light of developments and understanding about the importance of peatland and other issues which I've already highlighted. For a number of minerals extraction sites, nature conservation is indeed the most appropriate and locally desirable after use. I urge the Scottish Government and across the Chamber um, uh, but certainly the Scottish Government, if I don't move, to um, take the issues in this amendment forward. I now turn to 209, 210 and 211, which have been altered since stage two to limit the scope to only peatlands, not all mineral extractions, following comments from the, ministers, from the Minister. However, there are two difficulties. The onus is wholly on planning authorities to monitor whether sites are sitting dormant and this power does not prevent operators from leaving sites dormant for years, then restarting operations without input from the planning authorities. This amendment would mean that, the, that where an operator has left a dormant site and ceased operations for two years or more, their planning permission would automatically be suspended and they would need to proactively apply for planning, or, or, to the planning authority to resume operations. This would rebalance, in my view, some owners put onto the operators to keep their, plannings, uh, their permissions up to date and better enable planning authorities to become aware of dormant sites, but there may be a different uh, solution to this. In 210, the sunset clause, this aims to simplify and clarify the process of the review of old mineral planning uh, permissions by introducing a sunset clause for all old peat extraction consents, so, uh, setting a time uh, for all to be reactivated before they permanently expire. Or, sorry, or they permanently expire. Current permission periods are lengthy and poorly regulated, and I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but in um, 23 years uh, that these processes have been in place, there's ample opportunity for both site operators and local authorities to make use of the processes. However, in a report in 2003, some significant number of years ago, SNH for SNH, um, they struggled to draw conclusions about the progress with ROMP2, having encountered difficulties obtaining information from local authorities. So this is indeed another uh, concern. And the Environment Act of 2095 introduced a requirement for the periodic review of mineral permissions. However, only 15 sites are known to have gone through this review process, and there is no penalty or mechanism to enforce these statutory requirements. So I'd appreciate hearing from the Minister about whether a mechanism might be put in place more robustly. It tends to be developers triggering this process voluntarily. There is no centrally available information on, what site, on any sites where planning permission has ceased to have effect. And existent planning permissions also act as a barrier to obtaining funding for restoration through mechanisms like peatland action. The new planning bill presents a logical opportunity uh, as one way to simplify these procedures and to align planning with other areas of government policy on peatland. A clear end date for old planning permissions by introducing a sunset clause for extraction permissions would deliver this. This amendment would mean all companies with consents in phase two and three lists or any sites consented before 1982 would need to reactivate them, which seems quite a reasonable um, uh, stipulation, considering how long ago this was, by a fixed national date or lose the consent permanently, although restoration and aftercare conditions would still apply. This would remove long-term uncertainty for the status of the carbon in the soils and remove the burden on local authorities to instigate the process, overcoming issues with lack of, enforce of lack of enforcement and clear data collection. The sunset clause does not pose a risk of encouraging developers to start production at unworked sites with old permissions as it requires simply companies to reactivate consents. And we're, I think we're on to the last one. Some members may be relieved to hear. Yes. Um, Amendment 211 clarifies that any calculation of compensation for restriction 
on working sites for peatland extraction should assume that there will be no UK market for horticultural peat, as I've repeated. I'm not going to repeat the dates again. And uh, this would give confidence to planning authorities to consider restricting working rights in strategically important areas for peatland restoration, as it would give them more clarity on the scope of possible compensation claims. This would not result in a ban on the sale of these products. However, it would prevent the claim of compensation by peat, uh, extraction, by peat extraction sites on the assumption that there will still be markets for these products beyond the time period, that there will still be markets for these products beyond the time periods, but that the damaging project, product, products will have been phased out. Although planning permission and policy has a presumption, particularly policy has, against new commercial peat extraction, and Schedule 8 of the existing planning act allows local authorities to order the discontinuance of mineral extraction if it is in the interest of their districts, any such order would trigger a claim for compensation by the holder of extraction rights. Schedule 10, periodic review of planning permissions of the existing act, provides that compensation provisions are applicable where working rights to mineral extraction are restricted as a result of new conditions, except for restoration and aftercare conditions. This, in practice, has been cited as a deterrent to planning authorities considering limiting the length or, or size of peat extraction sites, even where the peat extraction is clearly not in local interest or in, in the interest of biodiversity targets. And I gave an example at stage two. I'm not going to go into the detail. Um, Ochen, Ochen Koch Moss in my constituency in Midlothian is one of these. And uh, the RSPB state that this site accounts for an enormous one-fifth of Scotland's total carbon emissions from peat extraction and is adjacent to a protected SSI. I'm not going to go into more detail on it, but it is a, a very precious site. I thank the Minister uh, for meeting with me to discuss these amendments and also for sending over information, um, I repeat again. And I understand the government has ECHR concerns uh, with this particular amendment, and I will listen carefully to the Minister's response on this. However, there is a clear public interest in ensuring that peatlands are safeguarded and for a more transparent and realistic basis for compensation claims to prevent instances like the one I've just highlighted. The Scottish Government has supported targets for ending horticultural peat due to a significantly increased understanding of the importance of protecting and restoring peatlands for carbon and wider ecosystems, and I hope very much that the Minister will consider this. And I thank those members who have been able to listen for listening. Thank you. Can I thank, before I call the Minister, I'll just say, uh, not just to Ms. Beamish, but to other members, these are the sort of, sort of detailed arguments that should be explored at stage two of a bill, and it's, it's, uh, it's very important. I don't want to diminish in, in any way uh, from the argument that Ms. Beamish put, and it's very important. She made it clear she wanted to read it into the record, and I am certainly not going to curtail any member who wishes to do so. But it is disappointing to have this level of detail at stage three uh, of, of proceedings. And I would just note that already, uh, the chances of us keeping to our timetable this afternoon are, are highly diminished. Uh, and I make that point not to Ms Beamish individually, but to all the members uh, for the stage we've reached. I call the Minister to respond. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm very grateful uh, to Ms Beamish uh, for the cooperation uh, that there has been. And I, I'm really, I really appreciate the fact um, that she mentioned Andy Kinnaird, the Bell team manager who has been a, a stalwart during the course of this uh, and uh, has uh, helped uh, a great deal along the way. Um, the Scottish Government recognises and supports uh, the need to phase out the use of peat as part of our ambitions for tackling climate change and promoting peatland restoration. However, I cannot support Ms Beamish's amendment since there are already a, a mechanisms in place to ensure uh, that these issues can be addressed in a, a, a proportionate and fair way. Uh, this includes existing order-making powers of, uh, in the 1997 Act for planning authorities to deal with issues around dormant mineral sites and a range of policy initiatives to phase out the use of peat in horticulture. I want to avoid placing additional provisions into the bill when they're already addressed elsewhere. And I would in, parti I would in particular be very cautious 
over forcing all existing sites to close without further consideration of the environmental and compensation uh, consequences. And Ms Beamish in her speech men mentioned the Peatland Restoration uh, Fund. Uh, her amendments have the potential uh, to require significant compensation or legal action for companies seeking compensation. And this government uh, considers that funding is more effectively spent on the peatland restoration fund. Uh, and I know that uh, Ms Beamish doesn't necessarily disagree with that. Um, although I cannot support the amendments, I do appreciate uh, Ms Beamish highlighting these issues, these very important issues around about Scotland's peatlands. Uh, the government recognises these issues and therefore uh, we brought forward our own amendment to the bill in a much earlier group to place a requirement on the Scottish ministers to have regard to the desirability of preserving peatland when preparing the national planning framework. And Ms uh, Beamish can be assured that when uh, we look at the national plan planning framework, uh, which we move on to next. I will be paying uh, due attention to what we do in these areas and I know um, that she will be at me uh, if I do not and I welcome uh, that. Um, in terms of some of the advice notes um, that uh, Ms Beamish mentioned, I'm more than willing to look uh, at what they currently say and whether they require uh, that updating and I'm more than happy to have further conversations with her um, in that regard. Um, what I would say that what we have done here reinforces our commitment to ensuring uh, that planning policies on peat ex extraction are considered in, uh, in the context of climate change. And I know uh, that Ms Beamish will continue to scrutinise how we move, for move forward on all of these issues. Uh, and my door is always open uh, to speak. I, I, I'll take the intervention. Yes, Claudia Beamish. Could the Minister just clarify for me, um, as I make the final decision as to whether to move or not move these amendments, in relation to those very long-term outstanding sites, um, which there is a lot of uncertainty around and uh, perhaps a lack of clarity in relation to what the local government um, uh, relevant uh, planning authorities are, are, are doing, is it possible for the minister to highlight this to local authorities that because it is a serious concern about the possibility of the start restarting of sites if I don't move this amendment? Um, Sir, so I'm happy to talk to local authorities uh, about these issues. Uh, there's no problem in, in that at all. Uh, what I would be concerned about, and this is where we need to, to, to make the ultimate consideration and, to, and making the right choice, is round about those compensation consequences. But I'm happy to discuss these matters um, with local authorities. Um, but, you know, I'm always wary of the comp compensation consequences that there may be. And I would rather spend money in peatland rest restoration rather than um, consequences. But I I'm more than happy to talk to the local authorities around about th these issues. Thank you very much. And there are no other uh, members who wish to contribute. So can I ask Claudia Beamish to wind up on this and to uh, decide whether to uh, press or withdraw the amendments in her name? Right. Uh, presiding officer, I do not intend to move these uh, amendments today. It has been a very difficult decision and um, there have been a range of NGOs who have had very serious concerns about the protections for peatlands. Um, RS PP being one of them who's helped shape these amendments, but certainly not the, them not being the only ones. Um, I think there is a serious issue in relation to aftercare. Um, we've seen what happened with the open cast industry, and I think it's very, very important that um, uh, conservation and, and those aspects of aftercare are really looked at more carefully um, uh, so that communities can benefit for their own um, mental health and for, for access to the countryside, but most importantly, um, for carbon sequestration. And um, I, I also um, think it's important that this, these issues are more carefully enshrined in the review of the national planning framework. So I would be pleased to work with the minister along with others on that. And as I say, um, I don't intend to, um, to move the amendments, but as a final point, I, I think it's strange that 
when there, will be no ag well, when there will be no market value for peat after certain dates, that there should be a concern in terms of the possibility of compensation. And I just highlight that in my final sentence. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms Beamish. And uh, Ms Beamish wishes to... Does any member object if Ms Beamish withdraws Amendment 208? No one objects. Uh, and can I just confirm that Ms Beamish does not wish to move Amendments 209, 2010 or 2011, 211. Not 2010, just 210 and 211. Not moved? That, not that's moved. correct. Thank you very much, Ms Beamish. In that case, we now turn to Group 40, Infrastructure Levy. Can I call Amendment 213 in the name of Claudia Beamish? And this is grouped with the amendments as shown in the groupings. So, Claudia Beamish, to move Amendment 213 and to speak to the other amendments in this group on Infrastructure Levy. Right. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, members will be pleased to hear that this is a, a short set of speaking notes. Hooray. Hooray. Yes, absolutely. Right, so my amendment um, 213 um, adds green and blue infrastructure to the list. And 214 uh, defines this as, I quote, features of the natural and built environments, including water, that provide a range of ecosystem and social benefits. At stage two, members will recall, I had a similar amendment uh, adding nature conservation management issues to this list. The minister explained those liable to pay the levy do not want the definition widened too far and that nature conservation measures would not help the levy's aim, which was the key aim of which to enable infrastructure capacity issues to allow development. This amendment has been reworked to bring natural solutions out of the environment silo. Green and blue infrastructure gives scope for infrastructure that helps address environmental concerns such as flood defences, water supply, loss of public green space, climate change and protection of biodiversity and the wider environment. The policy memorandum states the levy should capture land value uplift for, uplift for public benefit. In this context, the preventative spend angle of these projects should not be disregarded particularly when many parts of South Scotland and beyond faced flood warnings uh, a few weeks ago. Using the levy in this way would help contribute to Scotland's commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and in particular help meet the UN target to decouple economic development from environmental degra degradation, if I can say that word. If the infrastructure levy is to achieve its objectives and deliver offsetting public benefits, then it must directly address the causes of the accumulating public costs of development and economic activity. It is difficult to see how this can be realistically achieved without new investment in green infrastructure and blue infrastructure, which can offset these costs. In the face of the climate and environment emergency, I hope members across this chamber will support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Beamish. And can I call Alexander Stewart to speak to Amendment 218? And the other amendments in this group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My amendment 218 causes and ceases the bill does not have currently condition for regarding applications for infrastructure levy, the development which are also subject to planning obligations under Section 75 of the Town and Country Act 1997. There is potential for duplication of contributions on such developments, i.e. a contribution being required for the same object or purpose under both the planning obligation and by way of the infrastructure levy. This would be inappropriate for persons such as developers to be required to contribute twice for the same object or purpose. This could impact upon development. This amendment seeks to avoid by specifically enabling any infrastructure levy regulations made by Scottish Ministers to provide by the granting of relief for the liability to pay infrastructure levy where the developer is subject to a Section 75 objection and where the planning authority considers that to require payment of an infrastructure levy in respect of that would be a contribution and the person who would be liable to pay the infrastructure levy. Historic Homes are supportive of this amendment and I believe there is merit in such a provision. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Stewart. And I call the Minister, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this bill has been a marathon effort. Uh, we have come to the last group of amendments. 
uh, and I'm delighted to say that I support all of the amendments in the group. I'll just say a, a little bit more uh, on that, and it will be a little. Uh, the Local Government and Communities Committee highlighted concerns that the power to establish an infrastructure levy may remain in legislation but never actually be implemented. I brought forward an amendment at stage two introducing a sunset clause, meaning the power to establish a levy would lapse if it is not used within 10 years of royal assent. Although this amendment was accepted, uh, views uh, su some, of, some members felt that this was uh, too long. I've looked at the timescales and feasibility of bringing forward levy regulations, and I'm happy to propose Amendment 149 to reduce that time period from 10 years to seven years. And I'm confident that this will still give us su sufficient time for the additional work and consultation that is needed to inform the regu regulations. During stage two, concerns were also raised over the timing of payment of the infrastructure levy and the fact that payment may be sought prior to the granting of planning permission. To address these concerns, I've proposed Amendment 150 to remove paragraph 9 of Schedule 1 of the Bill so that regulations cannot preclude planning permission from being granted on the basis of non-payment of the infrastructure levy. The potential for overlap between the infrastructure levy and Section 75 planning obligations has also emerged as a concern. In particular, the issue of duplication and double charging has been raised, and I believe that it's, uh, it's a reasonable point. I'm therefore happy to support Amendment 218 from uh, Mr Stewart, which will provide greater cer certainty for the industry. Uh, the bill includes a wide definition of infra infrastructure, uh, which funds from the levy could be used to support. However, there have been calls uh, for specific reference to be made to green and blue infrastructure to be included within that definition. Uh, again, I'm grateful to Claudia Beamish for her uh, cooperation and communication about all of this. Uh, Amendment 213 uh, seeks to uh, do uh, what I highlighted previously, and I'm happy to support it. Proposed Amendment 214 introdu introduces a, a broad definition of what green and blue infrastructure consists of. I do have some concerns about the detail of this definition, but I'm content that the bill contains sufficient flexibility should circumstances change, and these definitions need to be amended in the future. I'm also, therefore, happy uh, to support that amendment too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call on Claudia Beamish to wind up in this group. Uh, I'm delighted that um, the Minister has accepted the amendments on green and blue infrastructure, which will help with um, our climate and our environment emergency and also help with the well-being of the people of Scotland. And I don't wish to say any more than that, except just to note um, what a tough gig it's been for everybody and uh, just say well done all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms Beamish. I, the question, therefore, is that uh, Amendment 213 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask Claudia Beamish to move Amendment 214? Move, that is moved. The question is that Amendment 214 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 149 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. 149. Uh, move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 149 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask Alec Rowley if he wishes to move Amendment 215? This was debated with 112. Uh, move, President. That is moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 215... Oh, we have no one said yet, no yet. The question is that Amendment 215 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. That is the first division of this session, so I'm going to ring the bell and summon members to the chamber. There will be a five minute suspension.
that is us resuming. And the question is that Amendment 215 be agreed to and members may cast their votes now. This will be a 30-second division on Amendment 215. The result of the vote on Amendment 215 in the name of Alec Rowley is yes, 29, no, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 217 in the name of Andy Whiteman? Andy Whiteman to move? Not moved. That is not moved. Can I call Amendment 216 in the name of Claudia Beamish? Uh, moved with, uh, debated with Amendment 132. Claudia Beamish to move or not move Amendment 216? Oh, this was debated with Amendment 132 earlier. One, three, two. Oh my God. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> okay, that is moved. The question is that Amendment 216 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and members may cast their votes now on Amendment 216. The result of the vote on Amendment 216 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes, 28, no, 82. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I call Amendment 218 and ask, ask Alexander Stewart if he wishes to move or not move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 218 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no we're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now on Amendment 218. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 218 in the name of Alexander Stewart is yes, 80, no, 31. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call Amendment 150 in the name of the Minister? Minister to move. Uh, move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 150 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote on Amendment 150 and members may vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment 150 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 80, no, 30. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Can I call amendments, uh, in fact, can I invite the Minister to move amendments 106 to 110 on block? Moved on block. Thank you. Now, would any member object if I put the question on amendments 106 to 110 on block? No. Thank you. In that case, the question is that Parliament agrees amendments 106 to 110. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
Can I call amendment and invite uh, Claudia Beamish to move or not move amendment 219? Move, presiding. That is moved. The question is that amendment 219, 219 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now on amendment 219. The result of the vote on amendment number 219 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes 52, no 59. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Can I invite the Minister to move amendments 151, 111 and 152 on block? Uh, moved on block. Thank you. The first question is that amendment 151 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that amendment 111 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Amendment 152 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 159 in the name of Rachel Hamilton? Already debated. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Let's see where Rachel Hamilton is. Thank you very much, <laughs> Ms Smith. Uh, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 159 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote on Amendment, amendment 159, and members may vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 159 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, yes 78, no 31. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now the, can I call amendment 220 in the name of Claudia Beamish? Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Not move. Sorry. That is not moved. Can I ask Claudia Beamish, is, Claudia Beamish if she wishes to move amendment 221? Not moved. That is not moved. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister to move one, Amendment 153? Uh, moved, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that, that Amendment 153 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask the Minister to move Amendment 154? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 154 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I ask Claudia Beamish if she wishes to move Amendment 222? Not moved. Thank you. That is not moved. Can I ask Alec Rowley if he wishes to move Amendment 223? Uh, not move, President. That is not moved. Thank you, Mr Rowley. Can I ask the Minister to move Amendment 155? Uh, moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 155 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister to move Amendment 185? Uh, moved, President Officer. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 185 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division and members may cast their votes now on Amendment 185.
result of the vote on amendment number 185 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 102, no, 10. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And that ends our consideration of amendments. And can I thank all the members and the Minister for their time and effort over three days. Uh, before we move on to portfolio questions, uh, at this point in proceedings, I have to make a determination on whether or not uh, any provision in this bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system or the franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In my view, it does no such thing. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority at stage three. And we'll move on shortly to portfolio questions. We'll just give a few moments for the members and minister to change seats.